presentation tonight is entitled Discover Bible Prophecy's Answer for Human Suffering. And really what begins tonight is the first in a three-part series. The first tonight is, as we've already said, the answer for human suffering. Then we take uh, tomorrow night off, but we'll be back Thursday and Friday for parts one and two of a series entitled Discover the War Behind the Wars. And really, these three presentations sort of fit together as a single unit. Now that is going to set up the next two presentations, which I am very excited about, which you should be as well. Those presentations are entitled, Discover Does Jesus Christ Have a Twin? And then the next night is Discover the Actual, Definite, Certain, Unavoidable Identity of the Antichrist. Now, some people say, wait a minute, wait a minute. You're actually going to tell us who the Antichrist is? No, no, I'm not going to tell you. What we're going to do is look at it from the Bible, and you will tell me who the Antichrist is. I'm not kidding. We'll put all of the identifying characteristics up there from the Bible, not from a man, and you will be able to tell me at the end of the evening exactly who the Antichrist is. Now, you say, well, why don't you just do that tonight? That's really what we'd like to hear tonight. The problem there is we have to set these things in their proper context. In their proper what, everyone? Context. context. And really, tonight is the fourth night of our series. And if, you, if you've been paying attention, you'll see a very logical sequence in what's taking place. The first night was basically an introduction. It was a what, everyone? An introduction. And, and we, we asked basic questions like, what is prophecy? And how can we understand prophecy? And where can I find true and reliable prophecy? And we looked at those two keys for understanding Bible prophecy, and particularly the book of Revelation. Number one, in the book of Revelation, the Old Testament is the foundation. And number two, Jesus Christ is the focus. Who's the focus, everyone? Jesus Christ. And so the opening night was kind of an introduction. Then the second night, we looked at this statue here. Our message was entitled, Discover Ancient Babylon and How They Foretold the End of the World. And this gives us a sense of where we are in the sweep of time. This gives us a sense of where we are. Have you ever been to one of those large malls or maybe a large shopping center or something and they'll have those billboards that show all of the different stores, all of the different cafeterias, and there'll be a little red dot there and it says what? You are here. You know, I've discovered something. I've been here all my life. I, there's never been a time in my life where I wasn't right here. And so I look at that sign and I think, oh, look, the sign knows where I am. I am, in fact, right here. But in, in terms of a prophetic sense, what this gives us is a grand sweep of time and lets us know you are not here, you are not here, you are not here, you are not here, you are, say it with me, here. The head of gold, of course, Babylon, the chest and arms of silver, Medo-Persia, the belly and thighs of bronze, Greece, the long legs of iron represented who, everyone? Do you remember? Rome, the feet of iron and clay represented divided Rome, and the very next thing that happened was what, everyone? The stone struck the image on the feet, and that stone became a great mountain and filled the whole earth. You're all A students. Exactly. And so what we did that second night is we said, where are we in the grand sweep of things? Then last night we asked the question, okay, so we're living down in those toes, down in those feet of iron and clay, but just how near is the end? And last night we presented what I consider to be very compelling evidence that we are living in the very closing hours of this, this earth's history. That is to say that this thing is wrapping up rapidly. If you agree with that, I want you just to raise your hand and say amen. That's exactly right. We did our best last night. We gave 10 signs of the times. And somebody's going to say, a skeptically minded person's going to say, oh, those signs of the times have been around forever. There's always been earthquakes. There's always been famines. There's always been pestilence. There's always been wars and rumors of wars, etc., etc. But what were the two illustrations, the two analogies that Jesus gave us to understand the context of those signs of the times? What was the first one? That's ex labor pains. That's right. And what was the second one? A fig tree. And do you remember that those two analogies have three things in common? Let's see if you can remember those. They were all, they were both visible and they were both progressive and they were both climactic. That's right. And so what Jesus is saying is that these signs are not new signs. They're not some new thing. It's things that have been happening, sure, throughout the sweep of history, but just before the end, they will increase, listen carefully, in both frequency and in intensity. 
What two things did I say, everyone? Frequency and intensity. And, and so you get this sense that these things are happening with greater frequency, greater intensity, until it eventually reaches a fever pitch. Just as in labor pains, they are further apart and then closer and closer and closer, and eventually you have a baby. And so too with the fig tree. It becomes tender and it puts forth its leaves, and eventually you have a fig and then summer. And so what this has done for us in the first three nights has really set a context. Night number one is the simple introduction. The next two nights gave us a sense of urgency that it is not business as usual. Gave us a sense of what, everyone? Urgency. And that's really what we're trying to do here is, is create a sense that something is happening in the world. What we're going to begin now is to go into the great books of Daniel, Revelation, and other books and begin to unpack some of these monumental and amazing prophecies with this context of urgency. In fact, tonight we're actually going to be taking a preliminary look at the Antichrist. We will talk about the Antichrist, but remember the focus of the book of Revelation is not the Antichrist, it's who, everyone? Jesus Christ. And tonight we will actually be taking a preliminary look at just who this Antichrist figure is and what he intends to do. So let's begin by looking at our study guide. Hopefully every one of you has a study guide. I just want to reiterate that if you bring a friend, Nathan said this, I want to reiterate it, by all means, you bring five friends, you get five free CDs. You bring ten friends, you get ten free CDs. Listen, we are not about making money. I could care less about that. We want this message to get out. Can you say amen? amen? So notice this with me. We're right there on the study guide. You have that there in front of you. And we'll begin by looking at the opening two paragraphs. It says, if God is so good... How many of you tonight that believe that God is good? Yeah, I believe the very same thing. That's exactly right. God is good. It says, if God is so good, then why does the world seem so bad most of the time? Why do bad things happen to good people? And why does there have to be so much pain, suffering, and sorrow in the world today? What is going on? Next paragraph. These are all legitimate questions and good questions. Some people think that there are no answers to questions like these. This is the very kind of question that I used to ask as a skeptic when a Christian would try to witness to me there at high school or at the university I was studying at, try to tell me about Jesus and how Jesus saves, and I would just say, come on now, if your God is so good, then explain all the pain, suffering, death, disease in the world, and I would just blow them off. Most of them, unfortunately, could not give good, compelling, biblical answers to that very simple question. Notice the rest says, some people think that there are not answers to questions like these. I used to be one of those people. They are wrong. The Bible gives the answers to these questions. They are not pat or easy answers, but they are good, powerful, and even, what's that next word? Logical answers. Suffering, pain, and death are terrible indeed. But the Bible and the Bible only can give us a compelling context with which to understand these things. Behind it all, the heart of God cries out for the devotion, salvation, and what's that next word? And worship of His people. I'm looking forward to tonight's message, but before we get right into the Bible, we're going to first pray. You're going to discover that your capacity and your ability to understand spiritual things, if you've not already discovered this, is not primarily based upon your intelligence or your education. It's based upon your willingness to submit yourself to the one who wrote the Bible. Are we all together on that? Uh, the simplest way I know how to communicate that is this. I will is more important than IQ. The Bible says spiritual things are spiritually discerned, and so it's not my intelligence or my degree or whatever it might be that helps me to understand this book. The Bible says that spiritual things are spiritually understood. And so we have to pray and ask the author of the book to become the instructor in the book. Are we all clear on that, everyone? That's why we pray. We don't just pray as a formality, say, well, you know, it's a religious meeting, we might as well pray. Not at all. When we pray, we are very seriously asking the God who inspired the book to now come down into this room and be the one who instructs in this book. Are we all together on that? So let's begin with a word of prayer. Father in heaven, we pause for a moment here because we do not take these things lightly. We do not take these things uh, serendipitously, Father. This is serious and we want to understand your word for us in these strange and unusual times in which we're living. 
Father, this is the Discover Prophecy Seminar. And we want to know better and biblically just what is coming upon the world. So, Father, tonight, as, as we open your word, we ask that you would open our hearts. You have told us that spiritual things are spiritually understood. And so, Father, tonight, clear away the debris from our minds, the distractions from our minds, and give us, over the course of the next 50 minutes or so, a sense of focus on you and your word and your will and your plan for our lives. Help us, Father, tonight to have more than just an intellectual exercise and experience. Help us tonight to submit and surrender ourselves to your word and to your will. For we ask it in Jesus' name, let all of God's people say, Amen. All right, let's get into our topic tonight then. In the beginning, open your Bibles to the first book of the Bible, the book of Genesis. That's right, Genesis chapter 1. Genesis chapter 1. You'll notice your study guide subheading says, In the beginning, God and good. In the beginning, God and good. In order to understand the present condition of our world, we must first understand its original condition as it came fresh from God's hand. What was that original condition described in Genesis, the book of beginnings? Note the following verses. I've given you a list of them there. We'll just look at them quickly. I'm beginning in verse 1. Genesis chapter 1 and verse 1. In the beginning, God created the heavens and the earth. The earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep, and the Spirit of God was hovering over the face of the waters. Verse 3. Then God said, Let there be what, everyone? Light, and there was light. Notice verse 4. And God saw the light that it was good, and God divided the light from the darkness. Jump down to verse 10. And God called the dry land earth, and the gathering together of the waters He called seas, and God saw that it was good. Notice verse 12. And the earth brought forth grass, and the herb that yields seed according to its kind, and the tree that yields fruit whose seed is in itself according to its kind, and God saw that it was good. Verse 18. And to rule over the day and over the night, and to divide the light from the darkness, and God saw that it was good. Verse 21. So God created great sea creatures and every living thing that moves with which the waters abounded according to their kind, every winged bird according to its kind. And God saw that it was what, everyone? Good. You've got it. Verse 25. And God made the beast of the earth according to its kind, cattle according to its kind, and everything that creeps on the earth according to its kind. And God saw that it was Good. Verse 31, the last verse of the chapter. Then God saw everything that He had made, and indeed it was very good. So the evening and the morning were the sixth day. Seven times in Genesis 1, seven times in the creation account, Moses records under the inspiration of God, it was good, it was good, it was good, it was good. And then when he comes to the end, he says it was what? Very good. So we can safely surmise that in the beginning, everything was good. Now, there are many words that you could use to describe the world that we live in today, and there are certainly good things. There are certainly wonderful things in the world today, but good would probably not be at the top of the list. Just last night, we looked at 10 signs of the times, and unfortunately, all but one of them was bad news. The only one that is good news was the tenth one, and that's that the gospel is going to all the world, and that's the greatest of the great news. Can someone say amen? But the reality is, is that we live in a world that is racked with pain and suffering and sickness and death and disease. What happened? In the beginning, everything was good. It was even very good. Notice the next paragraph. This point is highly instructive. In Genesis 1 and 2, before the entrance of sin, the world was perfect, beautiful, and untainted by death, disease, or pain. A perfect couple, Adam and Eve, of course, in perfect love, in a perfect environment with a perfect God. You can't get much more perfect than that. So then what happened to create the state of affairs we see today? Pain and suffering and death and disease are the rule, not the exceptions. In order to understand this, go with me from the first book of the Old Testament to the first book of the New Testament. What book is that? Matthew chapter 13. Go there with me if you would. Matthew chapter 13. Again, if you have somebody sitting next to you there who is not getting to the verses or the chapters quite as quickly as you, be sure to help them. Matthew chapter 13. Here we find Jesus telling a parable. 
A parable is a simple story that illustrates a larger spiritual truth. Matthew chapter 13. We're going to take a look at a parable in which Jesus describes a man who planted a field. Notice in your study guide. In Matthew chapter 13, verses 24 to 30, Jesus tells a parable. That is a story that illustrates a spiritual truth about a field that was planted by a farmer. In verses 37 to 43, he explains the parable. Let's look at this parable together. Matthew chapter 13, beginning in verse 24. Are we all there together, everyone? Matthew 13, 24. Another parable he put forth to them, saying, The kingdom of heaven is like a man who sowed what kind of seed in his field? Good seed. There's our word again. That's the same word we saw in Genesis 1, isn't it? Verse 25. But while men slept, his enemy came and sowed tares, that is, weeds, among the wheat and went his way. But when the grain had sprouted and produced a crop, then the tares also appeared. So the servants of the owner came and said to him, Sir, did you not sow, what everyone? Good seed in your field. How then does it have tares? In other words, where did the weeds come from? Verse 28. He said to them, An enemy has done this. The servant said to him, Oh, would you like us then to go and gather them up? But he said, No, lest while you gather up the tares, you also uproot the wheat with them. Verse 30. Let both grow together until the harvest. And in the time of the harvest, I will say to the reapers, First gather the tares and bind them in bundles to burn them, but gather the wheat into my barn. Now, we don't have to wonder, we don't have to guess, we don't have to conjecture as to what this parable means because Jesus gives us the interpretation beginning in verse 37. Go to verse 37. He answered and said to them, He who sows the what kind of seed, everyone? Good seed is the Son of Man. Who is the Son of Man? Jesus Christ. That's right. Verse 38. The field is the what, everyone? The world, the good seeds. There it is. Four times he uses that phrase, if you were paying attention. He says it's good seed, good seed, good seed, good seed, four times. The good seeds are the sons of the kingdom, but the tares are the sons of the wicked one. Verse 39, the enemy who sowed them is the devil. The harvest is the end of the age, and the reapers are the angels. Fascinating. Jesus tells a very simple story, not difficult to understand. He said it's a story of a man. He went out and he sowed some seed in his field. The, they, the, the, the workers and all of those who were working in the field had seen him sow the good seed. They knew that it was good seed. But later when they came back to investigate, there was weeds among the wheat. And they went to the man and said, hey, didn't you sow good seed in your field? Where did the weeds come from? And here's what I want you to notice. In the parable, Jesus does not have the man saying, well, when you weren't looking, I snuck some bad stuff in with the good. What Jesus says is five words, five of the most important words in all of the Bible. An enemy has done this. Let's say that together. An enemy has done this. Look at the top of the study guide there. What kind of seed was originally sown in the field, everyone? Good seed. This agrees perfectly with Genesis. It began good. It began good, 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 even very good. According to verse 28, who planted the weeds? An enemy. In verse 39, Jesus identifies this enemy, and he says that enemy was who? The devil. Now, here's something I want you to, to get a hold of here. This is a fascinating concept. Jesus accepted no personal responsibility for the presence of weeds. I want to say that again. In the parable, Jesus does not have the man who sowed the seed, being Jesus, the Son of Man, accepting any responsibility for the presence of tares. He says five words. An enemy has done this. An enemy has done this. Well, who is this enemy? Go with me from Matthew 13 to Luke 13. Right? You're in Matthew. The next book is Mark. And the next book is Luke Matthew, Mark, we're going to Luke 13. From Matthew 13 to Luke 13. Incidentally, we are working our way toward Revelation 13. We're going to spend a fairly significant amount of time tonight talking about the Antichrist, but we need to work our way there so we can understand it in a biblically holistic manner. Luke chapter 13. Jesus here tells a story. Let's, let's pick it up. It's actually not a story that he tells as a parable. It's the recounting of an experience that Jesus had. Luke chapter 13, beginning in verse 10. What verse, everyone? Now, he was teaching in one of the synagogues on the 
Sabbath. And behold, there was a woman who had a, a spirit of infirmity. How many years, everyone? 18 years, and she was bent over and could in no ways raise herself up. But when Jesus saw her, he called her to him, and he said to her, Woman, you are loosed from your infirmity, from your sickness. And he laid his hands on her, and immediately she was made straight and glorified God. Verse 14, But the ruler of the synagogue answered with indignation, because Jesus had healed on the Sabbath, and he said to the crowd, There are six days in which men ought to work, Therefore, come and be healed on them and not on the Sabbath day. Verse 15, Then the Lord answered and said, Hypocrite. Jesus was not being a name caller here. The word hypocrite comes from the Greek word Hippocrates, which means actor. Jesus says you're an actor. You're wearing religious clothes. You're talking religious language. You're hanging out in religious places. But really, you're an actor. Actor, he says, does not each one of you on the Sabbath loose his ox or a donkey from the stall and lead it away to water it? Now look at verse 16. Fascinating. Fascinating. There are four words here that are central to this text. So ought not this woman, being a daughter of Abraham, whom Satan has bound, think of it for 18 years, be loosed from this bond on the Sabbath day? What are the four words there in verse 16? whom Satan has bound. Notice again, does Jesus take any responsibility for the woman's condition in her infirmed state, yes or no? None at all. In fact, it's just like the devil to bend you over, and it's just like Jesus to straighten you up. Someone say amen. amen. Now notice what he says here. He says, ought not this woman being a daughter of Abraham whom Satan has bound? Fascinating. Just like those five words in Matthew chapter 13. An enemy has done this. Here he says, whom Satan has bound takes no personal responsibility for her sickness, but gets all of the glory for her wellness. An enemy has done this. Look at your study guide. Let's fill in the blanks there. Look at the study guide. Here is an essential point. Jesus confirms what Genesis described, namely that God made things very good. According to Jesus, the devil is the one who has ruined it. He is the responsible party. Read Luke 13, 10 to 16, which we've just done. In this story, who does Jesus credit for binding the woman? Who, everyone? Satan. Satan. Now, the word Satan is a transliteration of the Hebrew Satan. Satan. It's a Hebrew word, Satan, and the word simply means an enemy. A what, everyone? An enemy or an opponent or an adversary, that is, one who stands against. Just as Jesus had said, an enemy has done this, so to hear, he says, Satan, the enemy, the opponent, the adversary, put this woman into her infirmed condition. You're in Luke 13, go to Luke 10. Just three chapters before that, Luke chapter 10. Luke chapter 10. Notice with me verse 18. Jesus speaking. And he said to them, I saw Satan fall like lightning from where, everyone? I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Now, I want to just say something here right at the outset. Some people say there is no such thing as the devil. How many of you have heard that before? You've talked to somebody about these kinds of things. They say, oh, there's no such thing as the devil. Raise your hand if you've heard that before. Sure you have. Let me say something here. You can be sure that he would be the last to let you know. <laughs> Notice what Jesus says here. Fascinating. Luke 10, verse 18. I saw Satan fall like lightning from where, everyone? From heaven. Satan's hometown is where? Now, I want you to notice something very interesting. Jesus uses the word fall. The word what, everyone? Fall. And you can fill in the blanks there. Satan's hometown is where? I saw Satan fall like lightning from heaven. The word Satan means enemy or adversary. So you're right up to speed here. Now, I want you to think about something. If I'm walking down the street, say with Nathan, and Nathan can be a little bit of a mischievous person every now and then. You probably picked that up already. And let's just say that Nathan is feeling like a little bit of a rascal and he pushes me down, which he's never done up to this point. But uh, he, he might someday, you know, I, I don't ever let him get right behind me. But anyway, <laughs> if he pushes me down... Whose fault would my falling down be? 
<laughs> Nathan says yours. No, it would be his. Okay? But, but now I want you to imagine, if I was walking all by myself and I tripped and no one else was around me to push me down or coerce me, whose fault would it be now? It would be my fault. Unless, of course, you live in the United States of America and there was a little crack there and we say, oh, you know, it's really the municipality's department because the crack is too big, you know, no personal responsibility. The point here is I want you to notice what Jesus says. He doesn't say, I saw Satan. I didn't, he doesn't say, I pushed Satan. He doesn't say, I kicked him out. What he says is, I saw Satan fall. Fall like lightning from heaven. What we are going to discover this evening is that the responsibility and the culpability for his actions are his. That the responsibility rests upon his shoulders. Notice our study guide, what happened in heaven. I mean, is Jesus really here saying that Satan, this character, the devil, came from heaven? That's exactly what he's saying. Ezekiel the prophet, go with me in your Bibles to the book of Ezekiel. Now, that might take you a little bit to find. I actually just opened right to it. Lord, praise his name. So you open it up, you'll be right in uh, probably Psalms, and then you can go to Isaiah, and then Jeremiah, and then Lamentations, and then Ezekiel. Okay, you can find Ezekiel. It's one of the larger books in the Old Testament. Ezekiel chapter 28. Here we find Ezekiel comparing Satan to an ancient and evil king, the king of Tyre. Ezekiel chapter 28, and we're going to begin in verse 11. Ezekiel 28 and verse 11. Now, I want you to notice that as we read this passage, the word perfect occurs three times. How many times, everyone? Three times. Ezekiel 28 and verse 11. Moreover, the word of the Lord came to me saying, Son of man, that's God speaking to Ezekiel, take up a lamentation or cry for the king of Tyre and say to him, Thus saith the Lord God. Now some people say, This doesn't have anything to do with the devil. This doesn't have anything to do with Satan. This is only the king of Tyre. Hardly. What Ezekiel here is doing under the inspiration of God, God is saying, listen, I'm going to talk to you about this power, this evil man, the king of Tyre, but what I'm really interested in is the power behind the king of Tyre. It would be a little bit like saying, I want to talk to you about Hitler, but Hitler is not an end in himself. There's some power behind Hitler that caused a Hitler to be a Hitler or a Mussolini to be a Mussolini or a Mao Zedong to be a Mao Zedong. He says, take up a lamentation for the king of Tyre. And then he begins to tell us about this power, this angelic rebellious power behind the king of Tyre. Notice the rest of verse 12. You were the seal of perfection. I would underline that in your Bible if you are in the custom of underlining in your Bible full of wisdom and perfect in beauty. Notice two times right out of the gate, he says, you were perfect, you were perfect. Notice verse 13. You were in where, everyone? Eden. Eden. Quick question for you. Was the king of Tyre in Eden? No, no. But was Satan in Eden? Yes. Absolutely he was. You were in Eden, the garden of God. Every precious stone was your covering the sardius, topaz, and diamond, the barrel, onyx, and jasper, sapphire, turquoise, and emerald with gold, the workmanship of your timbrels and pipes was prepared for you on the day you were what, everyone? So he was created. Verse 14, you were the anointed cherub who covers. I established you. You were on the holy mountain of God. You walked back and forth in the midst of the fiery stones. Notice it again in verse 15. You were, what's the word? Perfect in your ways from the day you were created until iniquity was found in you. Now here the prophet Ezekiel, under the inspiration of God, is basically tearing back the curtain, tearing back the scene from the unseen in the same way that we might s separate this wall. This wall was up the first night and there were so many people here we had to open the wall and we get to see what's on the other side. That's basically what God is doing here through the prophet Ezekiel. He's tearing back the wall so we can see what's going on behind the scenes. Many of you have been to a movie before or a play and what's happening on the play and the stage is only just the, the, the part that you get to see. What's really happening is behind the scenes. And here the prophet Ezekiel says that you were created perfect. You were created perfect. You were created perfect three times. Who would have created him, everyone? God, that's right. And he says it three times. You were created perfectly, perfectly, perfectly. 
He says you are the anointed cherub. What is a cherub? That's an angel. Look at that again there. Notice that again there. Verse 14, you are the anointed cherub who covers. Now that is unusual language. That is sanctuary language. You say, what is sanctuary language? Very simple. In the, in the Israelite economy, the most important building in all of the Israelite economy was the sanctuary, later became Solomon's temple. Okay? The temple consisted of three parts. How many parts, everyone? Three parts. You had the courtyard, which was in the outside, the outer court. And then you had, does anyone know? If you walked into it, you had the holy place, and then you walked into the most holy place. And there were several articles of furniture. In the courtyard, you had the altar. In the holy place, you had the altar of incense and, and the table of showbread and the lampstand. But if you went into the most holy place, there was only one article of divine furniture. What was that, everyone? That was the Ark of the Covenant. Sure, you saw Harrison Ford in the movie, Raiders of the Lost Ark. There was the Ark of the Covenant in there, and it was basically a glorified box. In that box, that golden box, what was in there? Does anyone know? There were several articles, but the most important article was the very Ten Commandment stones. And on top of that box, that was called the Mercy Seat, and there were two carved angels that came up representing the very angels that dwelt in the presence of God. Between those two angels, there was a supernatural light that radiated from the most holy place of the sanctuary. That light was called, does anyone know? The Shekinah glory. Like it says in Psalm chapter 80, verse 1, Give ear, O shepherd of Israel, thou that dwellest between the cherubim, shine forth. That was the very presence of God in the most holy place and those carved angels represented the very angels that stood in God's immediate presence in heaven around His throne. When Ezekiel says you were the anointed cherub that covers, what he's saying is you were one of the angels that dwelt in God's immediate presence. Fascinating. Fascinating. Now look at your study guide there. Fill those in. You were in the Garden of Eden. Verse 14 says you were the anointed cherub, which is a what, everyone? An angel. Notice the next paragraph. This angel was created perfect. One aspect of that perfection was that God invested him with genuine free will. That is the ability to make his own choices. Underline this next part here. I've put it in italics, but it is absolutely essential. True love, in order to be love, must have the right to say no. That's exactly right. What makes love so special is that it is voluntary. If love wasn't voluntary, if love was forced, it wouldn't be love at all. In fact, in the English language, we have a very ugly word for forced love. We call that rape. Love, in order to be love, has to have the right, has to have the potential, has to have the prerogative to say, no, thank you. In order for love to be what God intended it to be, we have to have the opportunity to say no. April 4th, 1999, I was married to the most beautiful woman I've ever seen in my entire life. And she's sitting right there in the front row. It was a lovely wedding. Most beautiful wedding I've ever been to. Everything looked great except the groom, and he looked okay. <laughs> and I remember, I remember my wife coming down the aisle of that church in her beautiful, resplendent, radiant glory. And as she walked out, my, my knees began to move like this. Literally, my knees began to shake. I'll tell you a true story very quickly. Just about three months before, my wife's brother, my brother-in-law, had been married. I had been asked to stand in the wedding. And it, it was one of those churches that has four, five, six steps that sort of lead up to the altar. And uh, Felicia and Christian, they were standing at the altar like this and the groomsmen went back like that, and the bridesmaids went back like that, and I was the third groomsman standing in the middle of the stairs. There was a gentleman just ahead of me here, and uh, in the middle of the wedding, I noticed that he began to sway. He began to rock like this, and uh, just literally right in the middle of the wedding, he fainted directly into my arms. He, I just saw him falling, and I just caught him. 
right in the middle of the wedding. And, and of course, Felicia and Christiane could hear that something was going on, but it was their wedding. They didn't do a turn around to see. And so I had this guy in my arms, several hundred people there at the wedding, and I just picked him up and carried him out. <laughs> well, we got him into the back and we you know, slapped him around a little bit, gave him a little bit of orange juice, and he straightened up. We actually got him back out. He stood up there again, and Felicia and Christiane turned around, walked out, didn't even know what had happened. In fact, you can see it right on the video. I mean, it was just made to order. I can just imagine the angels were at the wedding just enjoying it, and they see this guy begin to face, I can get that guy. And they pushed him toward me because he just fell perfectly into my arms. If he'd fallen just a little that way, it would have been a disaster. Well, anyway, I was married three months later. And a doctor friend of mine was there and said, the reason that he fainted is probably, number one, he didn't get a good breakfast, and number two, he locked his knees. So I had this phobia on my wedding day of locking my knees. <laughs> Now, I'm telling you a true story. My wife comes walking down the aisle, and uh, she comes up, and, and, and I'm s standing there like this. <laughs> and uh, have you ever tried to stand like this for a long time? It's not easy. And uh, so I started to kind of shake like that. And my wife says to me right there in the sermon, she says, what are you doing? <laughs> I said, sweetie, I'm trying not to faint, you know. <laughs> Anyway, praise the Lord, I made it through. I didn't faint, but here's the point. There came a time in that ceremony where the minister turned to me and said, do you take this woman to be your lawfully wedded? I do. <laughs> and then he turned to her and said, do you take this ogre, uh, this man, to be your lawfully wedded husband? And she said, I do, praise the Lord. <laughs> and praise God, there was no pause there either. She said, I do. Now, here's, here's what made it so special. Nobody was standing there with a gun when the minister said, do you? This guy sort of stuck it in her ribs and said, you better. <laughs> what made her I do so special is that she had the right to say, I don't. Are you with me? Beloved, think about it from God's perspective. God is a real God who desires a real relationship with real beings. As one person has put it, God would rather wrestle with the stubborn will of man than reign supreme over rocks and trees. God has given us this thing called free will. It is a dangerous thing, but it is absolutely essential if there's going to be anything like true love. Sometimes in the past, I've taken my computer out. In fact, maybe I, I couldn't do it exactly right now, but I could just sort of show you what I do. I take out my computer, and I program it to tell me that it loves me. And I take my computer out, and I, I set it on a little stage. I didn't do it this time because I just wasn't ready for it. And I set it there, and, and I say, Good evening, computer. And the computer says, Good evening, David. I say, How are you doing this evening, computer? And the computer says, I'm doing well. And I say, Computer, yes, David, I love you. And then it says, I love you too, David. And then it says, I love you, 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 I love you. And when it's all done, I close the computer and I ask this question. Do I feel any better now that my computer loves me? Do I feel any better? You want to know why? The computer doesn't have a choice not to love me. I made the computer love me. If we don't have a choice in this thing, then our love is non-love. Does that make sense, everyone, yes or no? So God creates this beautiful, angelic creature named Lucifer. He dwells in the very presence of God. He was perfect. He was what, everyone? Perfect, but he had been entrusted with a very dangerous thing, and that thing is the power to choose. And he did choose. Go to Isaiah chapter 14. Isaiah chapter 14. In Isaiah chapter 14, we begin to see, that's just back through Jeremiah, you'll get into Isaiah chapter 14, we begin to see with a little more detail what was happening in the mind of that angel. Isaiah chapter 14, we're at the top of page 3. The prophet Isaiah gives us a deeper look into what is taking place here in the mind, in the heart of this angel. Verse 12. What's the first word of Isaiah chapter 14, verse 12? Oh. How. That's exactly right. How? Somebody's going to say, listen, how does a perfect being in a perfect environment made perfectly by a perfect God commit a sin? 
Yeah, that is difficult to explain. But you shouldn't be so worried that you don't understand it. Even the prophet Isaiah wondered how it happened. Notice what he says in verse 12. How are you fallen? There's that word again. Jesus had said, I beheld Satan fall like lightning from heaven. Here it is. How are you fallen from where, everyone? Heaven. heaven. That agrees perfectly with what Jesus said. Oh, Lucifer, that means light bearer. Son of the morning, how are you cut down to the ground, you who weaken the nations? Notice verse 13. He begins to give us an insight. For you have said in your heart, I will ascend into heaven. I will exalt my throne above the stars of God. I will sit also on the mount of the congregation on the farther sides of the north. I will ascend above the heights of the clouds. I will be like the most high. Notice the emphasis there is on I, 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 I. Satan had an I problem. Notice that at the center of sin is S-I-N. The originator of sin was Satan, Lucifer, who began to think about I, 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 I. At the center of pride is P-R-I-D-E. I will be greater. I will be grand. I will be something. He desired that which was not rightfully his. Lucifer, the light bearer, an exalted angel, became Satan, the fallen foe. That is what the Bible teaches. He had an eye problem. He was created perfectly, but he made a choice. He made a what, everyone? A choice. And God, being the gentleman that he is, honored that choice, even at significant cost and risk to himself. And that is the God of the Bible, friends. The God of the Bible is a gentleman. He's a what, everyone? He will not force his way into your heart. He will not force his way into your life. In fact, he says in Revelation chapter 3 and verse 20, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. But then he says, You ought to let me in. He doesn't say, Behold, I stand at the door with the SWAT team and I'm going to bust the door down and I'm going to cut in there and I'm going to make you love me whether you like it or not. Love is the foundation of God's government. Can you say amen to that? But love must be allowed to say no. God did not create Satan. That's going to be a huge surprise to many of you. God did not create Satan. God created Lucifer. And Lucifer, by his own free will, became Satan. If you and I were walking down the street and we saw a man there who was in the gutter, who was drunk, we wouldn't say, what, what kind of a woman would give birth to that? Ha <laughs> ha, come on. That's, that's, that's not what his mother gave birth to. His mother gave birth to a beautiful, bouncing, innocent little boy. And sure, uh, environment plays a role in these things. We're not suggesting that it doesn't. But ultimately, at the end of the day, in the final analysis, if someone becomes that, it's because of their own choices. Can we say amen? I mean, we live in a day and age in which there is basically no personal responsibility. If I do something wrong, it's my dad's fault. If I do something wrong, it's my mom's fault. Away with this nonsense. Ultimately, you are the arbiter of your own destiny. Take responsibility for your actions. Take responsibility for your choices. And stop blaming the world. And Satan made a choice. God did not create a Satan, an enemy. God created a Lucifer. Three times he says, you were perfect, you were perfect, you were perfect. But part of that perfection was the opportunity, the ability, the potential to say no. And he exercised that right. And God honored him as the gentleman that he is. And he made Satan. Lucifer himself did it. If that makes sense, I want you to say amen. amen. What did Lucifer want? I mean, what, what, what did he want when he began to take those precipitous steps? He wanted a higher position. Now, there it says four, three things in your study guide. It's really four. He wanted four things. Number one, a higher position. Notice he says, I want to go up. I want, I want to go up. I want to go up. We'll talk more about that in a future lesson. He wanted an exalted throne. That is, he wanted the government of God himself. He wanted rulership and dominance. And number four has been purposefully put in bold-faced font. He wanted, what is that word, everyone? Worship. And what we're going to discover this evening is that in the book of Revelation, worship is the issue. In the book of Revelation, worship is the issue. Now, without further ado, open your Bibles with me to the New Testament book 
of 1st, 2nd Thessalonians. See if you can find that, 2nd Thessalonians. You'll find Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, then you'll find Thessalonians. Look with me at 2nd Thessalonians chapter 2, beginning in verse 3. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 and verse 3. We move now into the portion of this presentation that deals with the Antichrist. And you're going to learn a great deal right now about the Antichrist. 2 Thessalonians chapter 2. Are we all there, everyone? Yes. Verse 3. Paul writing to the church in Thessalonica says these words. Let no one deceive you by any means for that day, and in the context it's the second coming, for that day will not come unless a falling away comes first and the man of sin is revealed, the son of perdition. That is the Antichrist. He's talking about the Antichrist being revealed. He refers to him as the man of sin and the son of perdition. Verse 4, who opposes and exalts himself above all that is called God or that is what? worshipped, notice this, so that he sits as God in the temple of God, showing himself that he is what, everyone? God. Now notice there on the third page of your worksheet, according to the book of Revelation, the dividing issue at the end of time will be the issue of worship. Note the way the Apostle Paul describes the Antichrist power in 2 Thessalonians 2, which we've just read. Do you see any similarities between the Antichrist attitude and Satan's, yes or no? Sure, both wanted to exalt themselves against or over God. Both long for that which is not rightfully theirs. The Antichrist goes into the temple of God not to show that he is against God, but what does the Bible say? To show that he is God. That's a subtle point that many people miss up. People say, oh, this Antichrist thing is going to be a piece of cake. He's going to show up on the scene. Anti means against. He's against Christ. You'll be able to pick him. It'll be easy. It's like shooting a fish in a barrel. Hardly. The Antichrist doesn't go into the temple of God to show that he's against God. He goes into the temple of God to show that he is God. We'll spend more time on that in just a moment. But notice for the purpose of what? He exalts himself above all that is called... God, that's the next line there, or that is worshipped. Worship is not a scientific word. Worship is a religious word, and worship at the end of time will be the issue. Now, with that in mind, go with me to Revelation chapter 13. This is the Antichrist chapter of Revelation. Revelation chapter 13. We're going to read the first three verses, pardon me, the first four verses of Revelation chapter 13. And here you're going to see this strange, unusual, conglomerate beast. Don't get hung up on the details. We'll come back to this. We'll spend plenty of time here. But just very quickly, I want you to see something fascinating and fundamental and illuminating about the Antichrist. Revelation chapter what, everyone? 13, beginning in verse 1. John says, And I stood on the sand of the sea, and I saw a beast rising up out of the sea having seven heads and ten horns, and on his horns ten crowns, and on his heads a blasphemous name. Now we're going to go through all of those identifiers. Don't worry about that. We're going to spend lots of time in this chapter. Hang in there. Verse 2. Now the beast which I saw was like a what? A leopard. His feet were like the feet of a bear. His mouth like the mouth of a lion. Notice this now. The dragon gave him his power and his throne and his great authority. Now, this is an artist's representation of what this beast may have looked like to John. Notice the feet of a bear, the mouth of a lion, the body of a leopard, these ten horns, and it says the dragon gave him his power, his throne, and his great authority. We say, well, who's the dragon? Look in Revelation chapter 12. Revelation chapter 12 and verse 9. Again, we could pass a hat around. We could take a vote and decide who we think the dragon is. No, 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 no. The Bible interprets itself. Can you say amen to that? Look in Revelation chapter 12, verse 9. There's no doubt about it. So the great dragon was cast out, that serpent of old called the devil and Satan who deceives the whole world. He was cast to the earth and his angels were cast out with him. So according to the Bible's own interpretation, who is the dragon? Satan and the devil. You've got it. Now, 
Notice again in Revelation chapter 13, verse 2, that the dragon, that is Satan, gives this creature here, this power here, this person here, his power, his throne, and his great authority. Now you might be saying, whoa, I've never seen a beast like that. I mean, surely we'll recognize the Antichrist when he shows up. I mean, he's going to look like that. We'll know him. Beloved, the book of Revelation is written in symbols. Written in what, everyone? Symbols. You say, well, what does that mean? Well, we'll spend lots of time on what that means. In fact, if you're really paying very careful attention, I'll give you a little heads up here. The beasts on this flyer right here, the beasts on this backdrop are from Daniel chapter 7. A winged lion, a bear raised up on one side, a four-headed leopard, and a beast with ten horns. That's Daniel 7. Now take a look over there. Feet of a bear, body of a leopard, mouth of a lion, ten horns. Do you see the parallels, everyone? Yes or no? We'll spend lots of time on that. Now look at verse 4. Notice the switcheroo, the switcheroo. Now that's a technical term. Some of you may have never heard that term before. It's a technical, it's a theological term. I apologize for using such a fancy term. Verse 4, it says, So they worshipped, there's our word, they worshipped the what? Now who's the dragon? Now notice what that verse is saying. They worshipped the devil. Is that what that verse is saying, yes or no? It's exactly what that verse is saying. But what? I mean, come on, give me a break. If the devil walked in here tonight as the devil with a great big sign around his neck, a placard that said, I'm the devil, and he stood up in front and said, oh, you know, fellas, uh, ladies, worship me. Would you worship him, yes or no? I mean, no way. Do you think the devil knows that? Of course he does. The Bible says he's subtle, he's clever, he's like a thief, he's foxy. He knows that. I mean, if the devil came in and announced himself as the devil and said, worship me, no one's going to go for it. The devil knows that, but he still longs and desires for worship and praise and honor and, and re uh, uh, worship. And so he has to get a, a front man. A what, everyone? A front man. But watch what happens. He gets his front man, say here, he gets his front man and he gives his front man willingly his power, his throne, his great authority so that when you worship the front man, who are you really worshiping? The one who set him up. Look at verse 4 again. Look at the switcheroo in verse 4. So they worshiped the dragon who gave authority to the beast and they worshiped the beast saying, who is like the beast who is able to make war with him? Look at your study guide. Look at the study guide. Uh, page 3, down there at the end. Revelation chapter 13 is the Antichrist chapter. You've got it. According to verse 2, the, uh, who gives the Antichrist his power, his throne, and his great authority? Who is it, everyone? The dragon. Who is the dragon according to Revelation 12, 9? Satan. Note carefully the switcheroo in verse 4. When the beast is worshipped, who else is worshipped? You've got it. And here Satan gets the longing desire of his heart. Worship. How does he get worship? By setting up this antichrist front man who goes into the temple of God to show himself that he is God. Beloved, think that through for a moment. The longing desire of Satan's heart is to receive worship, but he's smart enough to know that nobody would worship him if they knew who he was. And so he gets a front man, a religious figure. He sets him up with his power, his seat, his great authority. But when you worship the front man, you're really worshiping the one that propped him up. If that makes sense, say amen. amen. Now, uh, you can just take a look at there on the back page of your study guide. It says, Surveying Worship in Revelation 13 and 14. What do the following verses have in common? You look at Revelation 13 and 14, every one of those verses contain the word, guess what? You've got it. Worship, 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 worship. That is the central issue. Some people think, oh, it's going to be a political issue. Surely there will be political elements involved. But the primary issue on the great landscape of, of the Antichrist and his conflict with God's church is not politics. It's worship. In fact, you find very little about politics in the book of Revelation, but you find a whole lot about worship. Now, I'm going to prove this to you, and this is absolutely incredible. The pivotal issue at the end of time in the book of Revelation is the issue of worship. Now, go with me to the last part there of your study guide unquestionably the most audacious thing Satan ever did is found in Matthew chapter 4. You know Matthew chapter 4? It's the story of the temptation in the wilderness. 
Jesus had been fasting in the wilderness. Satan came to tempt him. He urged Jesus to make stones into bread. Jesus refused with the plain, it is written, it is written, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God. Satan then urged Jesus to cast himself from the pinnacle of the temple. Again, Jesus refused. It is written, thou shalt not tempt the Lord thy God. You know the story. And then the final one, the Bible says that he showed him all the kingdoms of the world and all their glory. That's verse 8. And he said, all these things I will give you if you just fall down and worship me. Jesus responded with utter indignation, Away with you, Satan, for it is written, You shall worship the Lord your God, and Him only shalt thou serve. This is where Satan's rabid and ridiculous idea reached its pathetic height. He had the audacity to ask Jesus, the Creator and the Redeemer, to worship Him. Think of it. At that very moment, Jesus, the Creator, held Satan's existence in his very hand. It would be like you walking into your house today and your little goldfish in your goldfish bowl says, Worship me! And you say, Worship you? I'm going to eat you! <laughs> the height of insanity. The height of intoxication and inebriation. Satan had the audacity to ask his own creator, to ask the redeemer of the world to worship him. This is case in point that the central issue pulsating in the perverted heart of Satan is to receive, say it with me everyone, worship. And so what is Bible answers for what is the Bible prophecy's answer for human suffering? It's very simple. God did not create Satan. God created a being named Lucifer. Lucifer made his own choice and created Satan. Jesus said five words, an enemy has done this. And then he said four words, whom Satan has bound. The devil is responsible. But what does he want? He wants worship. How is he going to get it? Through the Antichrist. Amen. Now I want to ask you a question as we close tonight. Has this all made sense? Yes or no? Okay, this is just the first message. Remember I told you this is, these all, three of these, the next three messages all fit together like a whole. We won't be here tomorrow night, but we'll be back on Thursday. And that sermon is entitled, that presentation is entitled, The War Behind the Wars. And we're going to go right into Revelation chapter 12. And you're going to understand Revelation chapter 12 like perhaps you never have before. Now before we close, I want to ask you a question. Who will you worship? Who will you serve? Raise your hand if you say, I want to serve Jesus. Forget about this Antichrist stuff. I want to serve the Lord. Let us pray together. Father in heaven, tonight we have seen in your word not just from the words of a man, the ideas of a man. No, no, no. From your word, we have seen that you are not responsible for the pain, suffering, sickness, death, and disease in the world today. We have also seen, Father, that the core issue in the book of Revelation is the issue of worship and that the longing desire of Satan's perverted and intoxicated heart is to receive worship. But, Father, today we say with Joshua, as for me in my house, I will serve the Lord. In Jesus' name, let all of the saints of God say, Amen. Amen.